Gaming History 101. Hey all, Fred Rojas here, and today we're going to be looking at a fun little piece of tech I purchased called the 3DO USB Host Controller, uh, which is by a developer who calls himself Nemo. And uh, the reason I decided to do this video is because Nemo himself doesn't do a fantastic job on his website of explaining the installation um, or the... Uh, uh, instructions for this device, and I figured it would be a good idea to make a video where you can learn how, uh, what to expect from ordering to set up to actually playing the games. Um, as far as the more technical stuff or uh, how things run, compatibility, he does claim 100% compatibility, and I've for the most part been able to confirm that. Um, I'm going to actually do a FAQ on my website, GamingHistory101.com, which of course a link will be in the show notes. Also, keep in mind, the links for all of these items I'm talking about will be in the show notes, so please read the description so that you can get some of the information you may be wondering about. Uh, just to jump right off the bat, I do want to point out that uh, this is not a review copy. I purchased this myself, but I thought it would be good to show some people because this can be very useful if you have a 3DO and you want to make sure that the most volatile object in it, which is the CD-ROM drive, uh, can become a non-point for you. So, there are three versions of this. So when you get to his website, 3do-renovation.ru, he is in Russia, um, you will be greeted with a couple of links based off of what you want to order. Now he's got a host controller for the Panasonic FZ1 model, which is the one I've got here, which is the tray loading type and probably the most common. Later on, Panasonic did release the FZ10 model. I do own one of those. It is a top loader and it's ideal because obviously the drive tray can't break. So a lot of people like the top loader, especially when you're buying a used console. The problem with Nemo's, and I wouldn't say it's a problem per se, but the problem for the average installer is that the FZ1 host controller is solderless, whereas the FZ10 requires some pretty decent soldering skills, uh, more so than my basic soldering skills. There is also a Gold Star model, the G, uh, the, uh, the Gold Star 101, I believe it's called, and he's also got one for that. So if you have a Gold Star, which is also a tray loader model, he's got a solution for you there as well. Uh, again, the Gold Star model and the FZ1 model are solderless solutions. So today I'm going to be installing the solderless solution. Now, once you know where you want something, you just uh, click on the how to buy link and you'll basically give him an email address and what you want to buy. And then in about a day, I got an email where he tells me what to send, how much to send to a specific PayPal address. And then frankly, that was the last I heard of him. Now, Nemo is well known for not being great with communication. Uh, Stone Age Gamer actually was selling these host controllers and severed their business relationship with him due to that. So this is something you should keep in mind before doing business with this person. Now, what I can tell you, and I I have no knowledge of Nemo. Like I said, we've shared no information other than a, a quick business email so I could purchase this thing and he has no idea making this video. Um, what I can say is the build quality is great. The device works fine and um, he did send the item. Uh, but like I said, if you're one of those people who would like knowledgeable communication, somebody who gets back to you, somebody who answers your questions and somebody who gives you a tracking number, you're not going to get that. And given that these items sell for between like 150 and over $200, um, that can be discouraging. But that was my experience. About two weeks later, I did receive my item. I have heard people uh, saying it takes up to four to six weeks. So I guess your mileage may vary. But assuming you're willing to take this plunge, here is the item, and so now let's just jump right into it, and let me show you how to install this on the FZ1. Now keep in mind, this is all footage that I took when I first installed it, not knowing what I was doing, but I've luckily edited it down for you to keep this short and sweet. Um, but uh, just realize I'm using old footage uh, that I always take when I install stuff, so that if I ever need to go back and see what I did, I've got a video record to easily you know, install and uninstall items, which is something I recommend for people in the future. With that, let's move into the installation. So the first thing we need to do is take off of the, uh, off the top lid of the 3DO, and this is achieved by turning the console over, and there are four screws that hold that on, which are located in recesses in the four corners of the console, as you can see here. So you just need a Phillips head screwdriver, or a cross head screwdriver, as it's sometimes called, and you just wanna unscrew these. My recommendation is to do diagonal points, so two at a time. I just unscrewed two of them, turned the console over to get them out of the recesses, and then unscrewed the other two. Keep in 
of mind, once you've removed um, three or four of these screws, the lid comes off really easily and there are some loose parts such as the power and eject button that can fall right out of them. So make sure to hold the console together when you turn it back over. Alternatively, and if you have any screws that are kind of tough to come out, you can just unscrew all four of them, lay the console on a flat surface like a table, and then pull the lid off gently and the four screws will fall into the recesses. So all you have to do then is lift the base and they'll be sitting there waiting for you. Take these four screws and put them aside. You'll need them to reassemble the console later. The next step is the shielding. Now you can see the shielding kind of covers the CD-ROM drive. It's just clamped onto the chassis on the left and right sides. Um, and when I say clamped, it's not even like really clamped. It's just slotted in there. But you do need to remove it from these like cross slots that are in the back. So they're in the back of the console like you can see here. All I did was it's a very malleable piece of shielding. I just kind of bent it slightly um, towards me, towards the front of the console and they popped right out. And then from that point, you just kind of wiggle it left and right on the left and right sides of the chassis and it comes right off. So there you go. It does reveal the CD-ROM drive, which we'll be removing in a minute. But the next thing you want to do is there are two ribbon cables. Now these ribbon cables will come into play. Um, you'll either need the ribbon cables that are in your system if you do the internal USB. But for me, I did the external USB. So since it's closer to the front of the console, Nemo actually provides with this kit uh, two uh, uh, replacement ribbon cables which are longer. So in this case, I'm going to keep the ribbon cables attached to my CD-ROM drive and all I need to do is remove them from the attachment to the motherboard. As you can see back here, there's a small one and a larger one. I just want to take them and slowly wiggle them out back and forth and then give them a light tug so that they come out of their slots. And then you can just leave them hanging from the CD-ROM drive. Uh, again, remember, you want to actually remove them from the CD-ROM drive if you're using the internal USB solution and leave them attached to the console motherboard. Next thing you want to do is you need to actually remove the uh, chassis that holds the CD-ROM unit into the console. Now that's achieved by removing four screws on the left and right side. You can see I kind of briefly went over them with my flashlight. There are two kind of elevated and easily seen uh, on the left side if you're looking straight down on the console from the front. And then on the right side, they're kind of into, sh into the shielding, but they can easily still be seen and there's a clear cutout. Now when you remove these screws, what I did was I actually unscrewed them so they were completely loose and left them in their recesses and then hoped they would come with me when I pulled the console out. Now three of the four did, but one fell deep into the console and I had two choices. I could either turn the console upside down and try to shake it out, which does um, drop uh, the two power and eject buttons, which are easily put back in place, but some of you might not be real comfortable with uh, having to put those back into place. And you might be roughly scared. I understand it's it's not cheap hardware if you ever had to replace it, but just realize you can't do a whole lot of damage if you're careful. Um, the easier way to do it was probably the way I did it later, which was taking um, just some flat uh, tweezers for like electronics and soldering work. And just um, as I got near the, the unscrewing process, I just tightened down on those and kind of pulled them out and I was able to keep a good grip on them. And then you want to definitely take these four screws regardless of how you extract them and put them aside uh, because you'll need them to remount the chassis uh, once we add the host controller. At this point, you can lift the CD-ROM unit out of the console, and you'll actually want to put the console base area itself aside. We're going to come back to it in a minute, but for now, just take the CD-ROM assembly out, and we're going to have to disassemble the CD-ROM from the chassis to move forward. Now, this is achieved in a couple of ways. We have to take out these cross beams here, which just have two screws each, so you just take your Phillips head screwdriver and take out both of the beams by unscrewing the two screws. Um, now, these screws you need to keep aside. You're not going to need them to reassemble anything later. Later, uh, at this point, uh, they'll just be if you ever want to reassemble the console. So what I did was a little plastic bag comes with every version of this host controller that uh, has two posts. And these posts are little pegs that basically attach the host controller to the chassis. You can just take those two pegs out of the bag because you're going to be applying them to the chassis in a minute. And I actually put the screws in them so that I can keep all my screws together. So you want to take the four screws you've removed there and put them in the baggie. Take the two posts and put them aside because you're going to need to hang on to them. And then at that point, you can just remove this black uh, top thing that holds the CD-ROM in place when the tray loads a game. 
Um, since we're going to be disassembling this, we don't need that, but you wanna keep it in hand if you ever had to reassemble it. Then from that point, all you gotta do is pull out the CD-ROM, but you can't do that without removing five screws that hold it to the chassis. The four screws are located on the left and right sides in pretty normal locations. And then if you're looking straight down on it from the front, in the far back right, there is a fifth screw you have to remove. Unscrew all of those, put those in the baggie alongside with the other four for a total of nine screws. And then put the baggie aside with your two posts, your black assembly you popped, uh, your black like holder you popped off, and you can remove the entire CD-ROM unit. Now you wanna take all of these pieces and put them aside in a safe place for storage. You might not need them ever again, but it's good to keep them on hand. Plus you'll always have a replacement in, in case you ever just want a CD-ROM unit. Next thing we have the chassis, and that's what we need to attach the host controller to. So the first thing you wanna do is lay the chassis down the same way it was when the CD-ROM was on there, um, because you're gonna just mount that chassis back into the console once we've attached the host controller. Now in the very front, you'll notice uh, there were two of the screws that uh, held the uh, CD-ROM drive, and the host controller is going to install there. Um, it's these two posts in the front that I'm going to install to. Uh, there are small ones. Uh, each one has two holes on these posts, so there are small ones in the front and larger ones in the back. You want to install your posts on the larger ones in the back. So you take each of these posts, and you just need to screw off the top. They're kind of like in a two-thirds length and then one-thirds length um, topper that kind of screws off of it. Mine was a little tight, so I had to grab some simple pliers and just unscrew it. But once I got those unscrewed, I was good to go. You wanna take the bottom part, which will be the larger size, and you wanna just put it through the larger hole. And then once those are both in place, you can lay the host controller on top. Once you do each side, uh, you'll notice it's a little bit loose holding when you just lay it on there. But once you screw on the top, and you don't need to do it tight, but you definitely want it to be firm and not moving, um, you'll notice it just locks it into place. Once you've got the host controller installed and locked into place, you're kind of good to go to reattach the uh, chassis to the console. Now for testing reasons, you might not wanna screw everything in, you might want to do that later. That's what I did. And you'll notice that when you lay the chassis back in place, even if you haven't attached the screws, there are screws on the motherboard that kind of fit into some extra holes that are in the spot. They are those small holes in the front. And those kind of hold everything into place. It's not a perfect fit, and you'll want to screw those things in to kind of flatten it out. You'll notice the chassis is a little wiggly, but it's enough to just get things started, hook everything up, and test it out. The next thing you need to do is attach the ribbon cables. Now, if you have the internal USB, you'll just use the ribbon cables that are already attached to the motherboard and hook them up in the back of the host controller. In my case, I have to attach the whole new ribbon cables to the base. So what I'm gonna do is actually attach them to the, uh, the, the base first so that I'm working with the same tools I would be had I left the ribbon cables. So all you wanna do is take the, uh, you wanna make sure it's uh, going in the same way it used to, which will be, there's like usually a flat white side and then a side with writing on the top like you see here. Also the silver teeth will be looking at you when you lay the uh, ribbon cable flat and you just wanna insert it that way so the silver area will kind of be looking to the back of the console. When you lightly tug on it, it should feel secure. And then I've got my two ribbon cables in place. The next thing you're going to do is lay the chassis in there and then you need to attach the ribbon cables to the host controller. It should be pretty clear where they go. Now with the host controller, it's actually got something that's quite common with ribbon cables where you actually need to pull out the plastic part um, that the ribbon cable fits into. It will, it's kind of like a locking mechanism. So you kind of just gently wiggle them out. You just wiggle them back and forth until they kind of pop out. You'll see that. Insert the ribbon cable the same way you did on the uh, motherboard by just wiggling it back and forth and then giving it a nice little firm push, making sure it's even and in place. And then you can just push on the left and right sides either simultaneously or back and forth on each side, preferably simultaneously, to lock it into place. Do that with both sides of the cable. And then you're good to go. Like as you can see, the chassis is in place, the ribbon cables are in place, and everything's kind of set. So without screwing everything in, because I don't want to do that yet, I just want to test it, we're going to put the lid on the console and we're going to test it out. But before we do any of that, we need to set up the USB stick. So let's do that next. Okay, first things first, you need to go to 3d-renovation.ru, uh, which is Nemo's site, and you need to click on the FZ10 host controller link. You'll see right there, there is a link for the BIOS file, and this will download an RAR. 
when you un RAR it, you will get the BIOS file, which will just go in the root of your USB and it actually loads the menu and is basically how the host controller tricks the 3DO into thinking it is a USB drive. Um, you will also get an NVRAM folder. If you're playing a bunch of different games, you're eventually gonna run out of space. There's only 32 KB of NVRAM, which doesn't hold a whole lot of space on the 3DO. Well, the way they get around this is Nemo creates um, these save files, which are just rips of the NVRAM. The problem is, is when you start using the BIOS, you'll see you can overwrite the NVRAM with a single file, or you can back up the NVRAM to a single file, which means that you have to have files present to back it up, and then you have to have files to load to. So what I've decided to do is anytime I load a new game in there, I just take any one of these save files, I make a copy of it, I rename it to the game I want to use the save file for. So think of it as a memory card for a single game, and then pop it right back in the folder. In this case, I made a Gex one. Now, you wanna format your USB drive. This thing only likes FAT32. So so I just plugged it into the system. I went to format. I chose to format it in FAT32 and just did a quick format. Um, I named it 3DO just so I knew what it was. And then I just dropped those files into the root folder. After that, you can use a folder structure in as much or as little as you want. For the sake of this, I'm just making a folder and naming it games. The next thing I need is ISO files. So anyway, if you have image burn and you have the disk, you just go there and say you're gonna make an image off of it. Make sure the file format you're ripping to is ISO. Pick your file name and then rip it. And it's simple as that. Once you get the ISO, you just drop it into whatever folder uh, you wish. If you're going to be converting though, either you've backed up to bin in Q format or you've downloaded, uh, the program you wanna use is WinISO. So you pick convert, you pick the file, you wanna make sure the file format you convert it to is ISO, you name the file and then you convert it. And then once it outputs your ISO file, you just drag and drop that. After that, you just want to eject your USB and it's time to head on over to your console. We just take the USB drive, we plunk it into the console's USB, and you just want to power on the system. The system will power on as you're used to seeing, um, and it will load it in a matter of seconds into this blue screen, which is the BIOS file. Now, right at the top, you can launch games, as you can see. Uh, you can also see there is a way to navigate down to the NVRAM where you can back up and load load various NVRAMs. The brunt of what you're gonna to wanna to do is just load games. And as you can see, games load just fine and rather quick. Um, so from the testing I've done, a couple of things you should probably know is that games load faster. They load faster, they load efficiently, and things load great. Now that we've tested our console, the only thing left to do is to screw the chassis back in with those four screws. You'll probably wanna use some flat tweezers like I mentioned, some electronics tweezers, uh, because there's no way your fingers are gonna fit in that area. I just kinda of set them in place and then started screwing them in and then let go of the tweezers and got them locked into place. I put the shield back on and then I put the lid back on, turned the console over and screwed in the bottom. Uh, now I've got a fully working console. The only thing left to do is to cut the hole out of the Panasonic and. Uh, attach the, the front panel, but that's a project for a later day. Beyond that, I'm sure some of you watching have some questions out there, so I've done a lot of testing on this thing, ask away. In the meantime, thank you for watching this video, and if you were looking to get this, here's hoping it gave you enough information to make a good decision. Until next time, this is Fred Rojas saying peace, out.